Thank you. Let me say good evening and happy new year to all of our residents. Certainly this is our first, uh, I, I believe, first meeting of the year uh, for what the Lord has done for us in 2023 with high expectations for what he shall do in our community in 2024. So from myself, as well as my, co uh, my colleagues on this council, to all of our residents in the city of Muskogee, happy new year. Uh, and we're starting off the new year, I think, in very high fashion by recognizing Ms. Nancy Ashley. And I'm going to ask that she join me down at the front at this time. Congratulations. So I was asked uh, several weeks back if I didn't mind giving you a key to the city, and I always ask certain questions. So I'm like, well, why are we giving a key to the city? And your staff jokingly said, well, after all, Mayor, she's been here 100 years. <laughs> and I said, I don't know if I'll repeat that or not, but they said that in fondness for all of the work and dedication that you've given to the city of Muskogee. So I'm going to read this uh, statement so that the community can know why we're recognizing you. Nancy actually began working for the city of Muskogee after her high school graduation in 1975. Her career with the city began in the municipal court clerk's office that summer before attending college in the fall. In 1976, Nancy became a full-time staff member in the municipal court clerk's office where she remained for the next nine years. In 1985, Nancy transferred to the investigations division as their secretary where she worked until retirement. Nancy has worked for four different police chiefs throughout her career. Nancy is an active member in her church where she works with children, teaching them choir songs for Easter and Christmas pageants, and making costumes. Nancy says, I have, I have enjoyed working for the city and being part of the police family. I will miss working here and mostly miss the people I have worked with. It's been good, it's been a good run, but I want to enjoy the rest of my life while I still have my health and family. God bless you all. And so. On behalf of myself as the mayor of the city of Muskogee, for your 47 years of dedication to the city, I am happy to provide you with this key to the city. <laughs> Council who'd like to come and join us in this photograph, you're welcome to come at this time. You have a dark color. <laughs> This time I'll officially call to order the Finance Committee meeting for January the 8th, the year 2024. We will stand at this time for an invocation that will be led by Council Member Alex Reynolds, followed by the Plex. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight to do the business of the city. Please help us uh, sharpen our minds and use our tools to the best of our ability. 
Please bless our city and watch over and guide us as we slide into some of this cold weather coming up. Father, please watch over our water lines and help us make it through without too many problems. Give us the blessings that uh, we pray for. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Attention, salute, lay it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Finance Committee item number one, please. To consider approval of Finance Committee minutes of November 13, 2023, or take other necessary action. Reviewing the minutes, are there any corrections or additions to our minutes? I move for approval. Second. Okay. Have a motion and a second to approve our minutes. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Patrick Hill. Yes. Carolyn Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item number one passes. Item number two, please. Consider approval of claims for all city departments December 2nd, 2023 through December 29, 2023 or take other necessary action. We have a report from the Purchasing Committee. Yes, the Purchasing Committee did meet this afternoon and we approved the claim, so I move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve our claim. list. any discussion? Roll call, please. Patrick Kale. Yes. Harley and Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Dear Free. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item number two passes. Item number three, please. Discuss and consider approval of second amended ordinance number 4198A, an ordinance amending the City of Muskogee Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 74, Taxation, Article 8, Use Tax, by amending Section 74-237, Economic Development Fund, amending Section 74-237H, removing the subcommittee and replacing it with an Economic Development Advisory Board, and adding Sections H, 1 through 8, adding Section 74-237I, and Sections I1, A through E, adding Section 2 and Sections 2A and B, providing severability <coughs> to the dealer and setting an effective date, or take other necessary action. Councilor Hoos. Uh, thank you very much. So we've went through this uh, a few times, and we did a council luncheon we discussed this instead of just having a, uh, a, a committee of council only with city staff for economic development and bring in some other members of the community. And uh, this would be a committee. It's not a large committee because you don't want a huge committee for economic development. But I know uh, that you guys have had a chance to review this, and I know it's been vetted. And my motion is to move it forward as written. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda item. Any discussion? <coughs> Please. Patrick Kale. Yes. Berlin Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. No. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item number three passes. Item number four, please. Consider approval of the lowest and best bid from Gray Manufacturing in the amount of $51,000 for the purchase of a new mobile column lift set for the fire department garage or take other necessary action. Mrs. Swepton. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, this item brought to you tonight is to replace an existing set of these lifts. They actually turned 24 years old this month. Over the last few years, we've noticed some age, some wear, some leakage. We've had to do some repairs to them, so no longer uh, they safe for service, but we've also outgrown them by the weight capacity of them. The fire trucks over the years and 24 years have just naturally gotten larger with more equipment on them, so we also need to upgrade as well to be able to ensure the safety of the employee working under it. As you saw in the picture, Mr. Uh, Miller referred to it as a, putting the fire truck on stilts, so uh, it ensures the safety of the employee and also protects the investment of the city. Those fire trucks are being well excess of a million dollars, so we definitely don't want them to come tumbling down off of that. Um, we currently have equipment made by this company. We've had it for 10 years. We're very, very satisfied with it. Offer great customer service. Uh, this is a budgeted item that you all approved in this year's budget, so we want to thank you for addressing that and seeing the need. Um, with that being said, we recommend approval. Design will be happy to answer any questions. 
Okay. Have a motion and a second to approve the item. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Patrick Hale. Yes. Carolyn Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Four passes, and that is our final item on the finance I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to our Public Works Committee for January 8th, 2024. Consider approval of Public Works Committee minutes of November 13th, 2023, or take other necessary action. Everyone's had a chance to review the minutes. Any amendments or corrections? Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. All please. On the public. Yes. It says November 13th, 2024. We corrected that. We sent out amended agendas. Yes, ma'am. Just to, pardon me, just to clarify that, that the amended agenda says the minutes of November 13, 2023. Yes, that is correct. Patrick Hale. Yes. Carolyn Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. <laughs> Item passes. We're striking item number two. Item number three, please. Consider approval of ordinance number 4221A, an ordinance amending the City of Muskogee Code of Ordinances by repealing Chapter 18, Buildings and Building Regulations, Article 2, Registration Certificates and Fees, Permits, Bonds, and Insurance, Division 6, Vacant Building Registration, or take other necessary action. Thank you. I'm actually going to have uh, my Deputy City Attorney, Austin Witt, present this agenda. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Um, have to bear with me. This is going to be a mouthful for a moment. Propose, proposed Ordinance 4221A in tandem with Proposed Ordinance 4222, the next agenda item, seek to bring our code back into compliance with amendments to state statutes regarding vacant and abandoned commercial buildings. 4221 would replace Chapter 18, Article 2, Division 6, which requires owners of vacant commercial properties to pay a fee and place their building on a registry that will be maintained by the city clerk. Amendments to Title 11 have pro prohibited municipalities from compelling lists that require a fee that would make our ordinance effectively unenforceable at this time. This issue will be addressed under Proposed Ordinance 4222, the agenda item immediately following, which creates a new and statutorily compliant version of the vacant building list that will aid the city in seeing vacant abandoned commercial buildings be addressed within our city limits. Amongst the changes that will be made, which will be further addressed by Ms. Bonehammer on the next agenda item, the statutorily compliant version of the list will not require participation or impose fees on building owners, will not be sub subject to the Open Records Act as protected by the state statutes, and provide the city the information necessary to ensure that vacant abandoned buildings are not creating a public nuisance and are adding to the overall value of our city. I'll be happy to answer any questions. So I just want to make something clear in this section. This agenda item, this particular one, is repealing our current ordinance as it stands because it's, it is contrary to state law. The next agenda item will be the new ordinance. So our po police powers do not supersede so it's under the current division some of the ordinances are currently unenforceable under the statute what we've determined is it made more sense to go ahead and repeal the entire division and create a new article because this is no longer imposing fines it doesn't actually fit under its current sub article so by creating a new article we're able to amend the language and become as much statutory compliant as possible without having to sit there and strike and underline throughout the whole thing and make it understandable for everybody Good for approval Discussion or any questions? <clears throat> Patrick Kale. Yes. Shirley Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item number three passes. Item number four, please. Consider approval of ordinance number 4222A, an ordinance amending the City of Muskogee Code of Ordinances by adopting Chapter 18, Buildings and Building Regulations, Article 10, Vacant and Abandoned Commercial Buildings, or take other necessary action. Ms. Bonhammer. Thank you. This is a, an entirely new article that we're adding. We've, we've repealed the other article. 
This one is completely rewritten. Mr. King and I have worked on this. We also ended up working with uh, the clerk's office and our deputy state attorney helped. So it's been a, it's been a, it's several months in the work, three or four months in the work, to completely rewrite this article. What happened was the state legislature, <coughs> excuse me, enacted a new law which basically outlawed our ordinances the way that we work with. So instead of having a vacant building list, which we used to require people to register on and pay a fee to register, that has been stricken. We can no longer require that. We can maintain our own internal list for city purposes of managing the buildings, and we can do that. That will no longer be subject to an open records act. The legislature found that re revealing the property owners' names and addresses was a violation of their rights and was, dis was po potentially discriminatory because a lot of the vacant buildings are owned by people of lower income. And so the legislature wanted to protect those people from discrimination or harassment. So in this new article, in the new section, we've tried to make everything clear and concise. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of it is to go ahead and be able to identify these vacant commercial buildings, establish an internal list so that we can, we can monitor the properties, we can still do vacant building registration plans with the owners to, on how we're going to bring these buildings into compliance, um, we can secure these buildings, we can go through the dilapidation process if necessary. And a lot of this is because of our the security risk and the homelessness problems that we're facing in Muscovy, the police and fire resources we're having to use, and so this will help hopefully beautify our city and help contain blight. And we have provisions in here about keeping the property grounds clean, keeping the building safely secured, keeping electricity on from our old ordinances, and maintaining an insurance policy in the event of problems. Um, it also provides for inspections of the property, insurance requirements, an appeal process in case so that they, we protect the civil rights of our citizens. That way we get, they get proper notice, they have the chance to appeal, they have the chance to work with the planning director in order to keep the building at least safe and secure. And I am happy to answer any questions about this. I had a question. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're keeping the building safe and secure. So what, you said we're requiring them to have an insurance policy? Yes, ma'am. And we're requiring them to have utilities on? Yes, it's to a group of people that's potentially unable to financially maintain that? Yes, and what they would have to maintain is some form of even base liability insurance. And the reason for that is we've had a lot of problems with commercial structures with, with homeless people camping out in them, catching them on fire, causing fires. Mm -hmm. um, some innocent bystanders can be injured. And that way, there's some protection for other citizens besides the homeowners. Yeah, and we're not. This is only on commercial buildings only. Just on commercial buildings only. Yes, and what we're hoping that this all encourages is for them to work with the planning director to develop a plan to rehab or remodel or sell that building. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. King will also he can present the, from the practical side what he how he intends to implement that. I think that'd probably be a good thing to have happen. So, good evening, Chairman, Committee. So, the vacant building ordinance is really aimed at protecting the public as well as potentially revitalizing some of these vacant structures. So, we're going to run this through a pretty standard code enforcement process. If any of our code officers run across buildings that are vacant or unsecure that can look to be commercial buildings, they will open a case on it. Our chief building inspector will go out and inspect the building to verify their findings. And then we'll send a letter to the property owner letting them know that either their property is unsecured and needs to be secured, um, or that we have found their buildings vacant and we would like to know what they're going to do with the building, whether if they plan on selling it, demolishing it, or revitalizing it for another economic opportunity. This really brings it down, like I said, to the revitalization of these buildings. Because when we revitalize vacant buildings, this really transforms eyesores into assets. So when these spaces are repurposed for housing, commercial, or even community centers, it will breathe new life into our neighborhoods and our commercial corridors. And this process often sparks a ripple, attracting more residents, more businesses, and larger investments. And we're also looking at boosting economic development as these renovated buildings can create new job opportunities during construction 
and afterward through businesses operating in these spaces. The increased economic activity can also stimulate local economies, generate more tax revenue, and attract further investments. And last and most, most importantly is that this will help foster community well-being, and that happens when one derelict building becomes a functional space. They provide essential services, communal areas, or affordable housing, fostering a sense of pride and belonging among our residents. Access to amenities enhances their overall quality of life within the community. Additionally, the reduced blight and crime associated with the vacant buildings contribute to a safer and more vibrant neighborhood environment. So, if you have any other questions about that, I will answer them. So, if you drive down here on Main Street right now, you see those half structures. What's in it for that? Because there's no way that they're gonna put any utilities to a building. It just so, especially like. With the ones that are on North Main, those are in such a dilapidated state that we would just go forward with the dilapidated proceedings. Mm -hmm. um, you want more building be like the uh, the old Connors University building on Fort and Second, right? That's just vacant. It's just a tall vacant building, not necessarily dilapidated. That would be a structure that could be used for commercial purposes. We would notify them that if it became unsecure. But at this point, we'd be notifying them that it's a really nice building downtown that potentially could be used for some other purpose and we would just like to know what the planner opportunity would be with that building. I can understand that. I just want, in conjunction to the other ones, the standalones, that's really a store eye. Right, yes. Mr. Miller. If I may, <clears throat> I think Mr. King uh, hit on it pretty well, but it says specifically in here that nothing about this prohibits us from moving forward with our regular process for buildings that need to be demolished, for instance. So. This doesn't slow down any of those processes. Mr. So. Chairman, I'd like as a, um, <clears throat> as part of your follow-up to respond to Ms. McGee, that if you or Ms. Bodenhammer will prepare an agenda item addressing those buildings on Main Street, where they need to go through the condemnation process so that we can do what we need to do to move those along. Uh, if you guys mind, I actually have an update I can give without an agenda. If that's with so this round, or we can just do another agenda? Probably item. two weeks. Okay, let's do that. I'll prepare one for you. Thank you. I think, I think what Mr. King's wanting to tell you is that there is work in progress on those buildings, and we'll give you that update in at the appropriate time as you requested. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further discussion? I, I do have a question. So this ordinance, um, can you refresh my mind? What is the time frame uh, for a vacant building? Uh, and, and so here's what I'm looking at. A, build, a business goes out of business. Is it immediately that they have to continue to keep the utilities on? I'm renting the building to someone, and so I'm taking back over <coughs> ownership of the building. Do I immediately have to, is there any kind of time frame? No, the, the, the utilities would have, the current utilities would have to be maintained mm -hmm. as well as insurance. And then there's a six month time period that the owner can work with the planning director to establish a vacant building plan, what they're going to do with the building, and we can assist with that, whether it's helping them file for different zoning changes or any kind of programs that they might qualify for. And the reason for that is one of the, one of the ways that we distinguish vacant buildings that are being maintained from those that are not being maintained is the ones, the buildings not being maintained will not have insurance, they will not have utility services connected. And that way, if there's any type of construction that goes on or any repairs that need to be made, there's the proper utilities to enable to the building owner to go in and have that work done. The, with, without utilities and without insurance, these buildings tend to dilapidate a lot faster. It's, if, you, if you leave a house vacant with, with no utilities, it's going to deteriorate much more quickly than one that's kept climate controlled, for instance. I uh, <clears throat> clearly understand this, and I believe that I had the same concerns when we originally came up with this ordinance. I think, you know, requiring to leave the utilities on, I just don't get that point. Um, I sometimes kind of feel that this policy is kicking a business owner when he's down. The business is out of business, and now we're requiring to keep the utilities up, and that could be a strain on that business owner at that time. And then I believe that this is also an attraction for homeless people. Here's a vacant building, utility zone, you know, that would be the first place that I would go break in and, you know, uh, set up residence. 
So, you know, those are my concerns about, about this item. Yes, uh, yeah, and I, I do agree to a certain extent with, with that. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if the building is vacant, it's going to barely use any utilities. You'll, you'll have just generally your base charges usually, so it shouldn't be too much. Now, did you say that it was electricity only? The base utilities, which would be the, uh, electricity, gas, water. If there's a safety issue, the planning director can authorize them not to have, for instance, gas hooked up. If there's a building sitting vacant, we may want electricity kept on, but not gas because that could be, if someone breaks in and builds a fire, that could make the building blow up. Well, and to uh, hop on some of Mr. Reed's concerns, it's an abandoned building, heat and air go off, and all your water lines start busting all over the house mm -hmm. because we got water on. Something doesn't make sense. Yeah, but also with a vacant building, if let's say there's, you have the water lines, you don't have any kind of heat whatsoever in that building, that, that will actually cause the lines to rupture. So if you have some... No, I understand that, yeah. but what if the electricity goes off or, or <laughs> something happens and they're down and then you get a, a night like some nights we might be having next week, one night will bust all the, the pipes in your house. Yes. But if you're not living there and aware of it, it could be a problem. I think you're, we're getting on a slippery slope by having all the utilities on. I think the electric, electric coming into a building can provide light, it can run a alarm system, it can provide the necessary things, but the, what Patrick is saying is 100% true. If you have a water line going into a building and there's no need to run the heat all the time, you're going to run into a position to where people are forgetting to do that. They're going to have snapped water lines, which we do have pretty frequently, and uh, it's going to create a lot worse problem for someone. It, it, I think a lot of times we get the cart before the or the cart before the horse here. Um, I've been on the historical preservation board and I had to get off of it because they kept putting more and more and more rules in to develop downtown. <coughs> if you want to develop downtown, you have to go to the title company and you have to mill out 300 feet around there and you have to make sure that all those people can come and tell you if they want you to do what business it is that you want to do. And then you have to meet the historical readiness of the building. Is it? What you're wanting to do going to meet some of the historical significance of what it was. I made this point rather frequently in the meetings is I do not see any list of anyone standing in line to develop buildings in downtown Muskogee. Why would we make it more difficult? And it sounds like you're going to make it more difficult to owners to hold them. And when you're in a down position, I have had buildings in this very position. Um, I've had a building that I rented out to someone that had a grow. They changed the entire use of my building, put in all kinds of additional things that's not for a traditional building, and then at some point they didn't notify me and moved out of my building. Well, now we've put in uh, rules about what we're going to do, and you've got to have special use permit. I've got an entire building that's switched over to a particular type of use that possibly can't be utilized for that anymore. That. Now I've got to decide, do I spend the money to put the whole building back to a regular usable building, or can I go on and lease that building to someone who already converted it for that intended use? And we keep opening quagmires for business people in town, and I think that it's created, we do create barriers for ourselves. Yeah, one thing I will point out, the, the requirement for utilities and insurance is, was already an ordinance. So that's something that council already passed and was brought over from the old section into this section. Insurance is, you're crazy if you own a property and don't have it insured already because you're liable for it. But some people may or may not understand that, but insurance and I think electric are things that you can look at, but a gas, running gas into a vacant building where I'm like Mr. Reed, if I'm home, so I'm certainly gonna try to get over to a building that has utilities and if I can get a gas line lit or something I'm probably gonna blow the building up but yeah, and, that, and that's why we have the leeway for the could be vacant, an issue yeah for the vacant building owner to work with the planning department on that like, issue I yield wasn't back. The ordinance wasn't it just one utility no 
it, it was not. Um, just to clear something oh, up. I, let me let me actually let me get back up on that. That was at that point I think was is electrical. Electric only. From yeah, are we understanding? Page of you are. Let me look at something real quick and make sure I'm correct on the insurance. Yeah, water and electric. That's why we don't have gas in there. That's what I wanted to clarify. It's at the top of your page 23, uh, number five. It goes to the utilities. Gas is not one of the primary. Does any city staff uh, have heartburn with electric only and eliminating water? I think one of the reasons that council previously approved in the ordinance to have the water part of that is so we can we can more easily we, as a city that's our utility we can keep track of what buildings are vacant and what which ones are not if they have a water account plus we they have they still have stormwater runoff that other buildings are paying for and other other building owners are paying for that a vacant building without water will not be paying stormwater fees. Uh, well, I think it's a big concern, a, a huge concern of mine, Councillor Reynolds, uh, having water on a vacant house inside the house. That's just an accident waiting to happen. Uh, I'd be in favor of this if we could strike the water and gas naturally. I can vouch for that. I, am, I have a commercial building. And that happened to my building, and the water bill is off the chain. They call me and say, hey, you didn't use so many gallons of water. I don't have, I'm not using any water in there. I do have the water on, but the pipe is busted now, so I guess I have used not to gallons damage. and gallons and gallons and gallons of water. I'm talking about just of late. This is not nothing. You can go back and look at the address and see how many times of this have happened. So, can be recognized? Yes, ma'am. I agree with what um, everybody has said. I would be in favor of this if we remove the water and the gas. Yeah, the gas is the not. The gas is not there. The gas is so not. I would be in favor of it if we remove. The water. Then at this time we could take a, an amended motion to accept it. Do we have that? Do we have an amended motion? No, we don't have it yet. We don't have a motion oh, yeah. yet. Do we have a motion with we, that amendment? Madam, Mr. Chair, this is committee. Mm -hmm. I would suggest why don't we just take this home and read it better and come back next sun, uh, next uh, Monday, next month, the next time we meet and take this with no action at this time. That way it can be read, vetted, and come back with a motion that's clearer than what we're hearing tonight. So do I need a motion to table or uh, move yes. forward without Recommendation. Yes. We can take no action, if you, unless you want to provide direction to staff. No, I think we take no action and go home and read it. Mm -hmm. so under that proposal, we'll come back with the same one, but you'll have, you may have amendments to propose at that yeah. time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And number five. <clears throat> Consider approval of resolution number 2971 to allow neighbors building neighborhoods to issue certificates of appropriateness on behalf of the Historic Preservation Commission for the Muskogee Historic Revitalization Subgrant Program or take other necessary action. Mr. King. So in 2023, neighbors building neighborhoods applied for the Paul Burn Grant from the National Park Service and was awarded $750,000 to subgrant to our federally registered historic districts in Muskogee. They are calling their program the Muskogee Historic Revitalization Subgrant Program. So, areas that this money would be able to go for would be the pre statehood commercial district, which is the one block at Maine and Okmulgee, uh, the Kendall's Place, Founders Place, uh, Bay Cone College. All of those residential structures and commercial structures within those federally registered districts would be eligible to apply for this program either to do exterior or also interior remodels of these buildings to promote um, economic viability and promote our historic areas. Normally with this process, when somebody wants to renovate an historic building in Muskogee, they have to come before the Historic Preservation Commission and get what's called a certificate of appropriateness before they get any permit issued by the city to them. Under this resolution, we would be allowing neighbors building neighborhoods to issue certificates of appropriateness for approved applicants to the subgrant program on behalf of the Historic Preservation Commission. 
And for any other certificate of appropriateness for someone who is not applying for the program, would still go through a Historic Preservation Commission in a normal capacity. We are doing this to help speed up the process of letting an applicant apply for all of it in one application period and during review by the sub-grant review committee at Neighborhood Fielding Neighborhoods with partners from Main Street Muskogee. They know exactly what they're looking for, uh, what would be allowed or not allowed from the Historic Preservation Commission's viewpoint and just allow the process to go through a lot faster and allow them to award that money quicker so they can get to their projects and get the historic district revitalized with those projects. We took this to the Historic Preservation Commission in a special call meeting in December and they did approve to allow neighbors building neighborhoods to issue the COAs on their behalf. And so for this one resolution, we are bringing it to Public Works and the Council for your guys' approval. At this point, staff will recommend approval and we'll answer any questions. I had a question. Do neighbors build a neighbors have staff on, have staff to be able to uh, give out the certificate? Yes. So they have a several review committee, and they're, part of the several review committee is uh, composed of Rachel Atherton, which is a former HP member, and also Melanie Carey will be involved too. Mm -hmm. Is at Main Street Muskogee, and they'll also be involved in that. So they have the expertise not only from the um, city side, having worked with the historic preservation commission in the past, they also have a strict adherence to the Department of Interior secretary, secretary of Department of Interior's design standards. So unless if they start deviating from that, then they can't be awarded any money anyway. So it's pretty set in stone what they can and can't do with the best interest of the Muskogee Historic Districts at heart. Any further questions? Entertain a motion? Nope. Second it. The motion is second. No further discussion. Roll call, please. Dr. Hale? Yes. From Amboyati Craig? Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery? Yes. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. Thank you. Item number five passes. Item number six, please. Consider approval of amended City Council Policy 1-6, records retention and authority to destroy or take other necessary action. Thank you. So this, uh, this agenda item, let me give you a little background on this. So the state requires cities to have a retention policy. What do they do with certain documents? What do they do with recording? What do they do with old records? Those types of things. And we have a uh, our own record retention policy that's multiple pages long and you know covers things like accounting accident reports all of those what we do not have in there is anything regarding the retention of photographs audio recordings and video recordings this is not in our retention policy we get several calls a month from different departments wanting to know can we destroy this do we have to keep this um, just to, for instance if they do testing of our audio system with our new audio system that's going in and speaker system, uh, does IT have to retain those, those recordings each time when they come in and test out the system? So how long do they have to retain recordings of the city council meetings? No one has, we don't have any rules on that. So per the new state law that's in effect, the, it's discretionary up to each city how long we retain that. And so what I simply did was transfer that into our record retention policy that is discretionary with our city. So if a department, for instance, IT, again, has a test recordings, they can immediately destroy those recordings. They don't have to keep them for any amount of time. And happy to answer any questions about this. Thank you. Any questions, any further discussion? Uh, attachment A that's in our packet? Yes. Yeah. Is this the new or this, this is what we had before? This is the same retention policy that we've had. I just added a section on photographs and video recordings is the only change to it. Um, for instance, we had to make use of this in cleaning out the basement in order to remediate the, the issues that we're having downstairs. Mm -hmm. so we had to follow this record retention policy and go through everything and you know, make sure that we're complying with the policy before we destroyed it a lot of things that were being stored down there. So the new section is on page 44 at the very bottom. The very last thing, it's about two lines is always what we're having. Yeah, it just says photographs, audio, and video recordings, and it's directed to all departments, and it just states the state law, and it's discretionary. It's not long to maintain. 
Spoonhammer on some of these that talks about accident reports involving city property. I know it says five years or until litigation is terminated. What well, that involves a minor? Um, because we don't re we don't release we re we redact those kind of reports. Okay. So if there's a report that involves a minor's name or an arrest record that involves a minor's name, and we get an open records request related to that, those anything involving that minor is redacted. But that potential for litigation, if they have the right to. What happens in those instances? So there's a difference between um, an open records request and then a subpoena. Okay. So if there's a court case that's actually filed and then there's a subpoena signed by a judge, well, then we do release that information. But if we destroy the records after five years? Yes, but the, the statute of limitations on accidents and uh, personal torts and injuries is less than five years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's a two year statute of limitation, actually. Any first further questions, comments? Can you entertain a motion? I have a motion. Do I have a second? Can make a second. 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 Motion is second. Roll call, please. Patrick Hale? Yes. Kirkland Boyati Craig? Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery? Yes. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Jamie Stow? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Roman Coleman? Yes. Item number six passes. Item number seven, please. Consider approval of final payment to APAC Central Incorporated in the amount of $138,439.58 for the Northwest Zone Mill and Overlay Project number 2022042 or take other necessary action. Ms. Rigney? Yes, thank you. So this is uh, part of the CIP zone street improvements that we've been doing. Um, this is a few months ago, we did the final pay for the micro seal, and then this is the final pay for the mill and overlay. The uh, original contract amount was just over $2.7 million. Uh, late in the summer of 23, we did have one change order to add some streets that we felt were important to add uh, immediately to that project. That brought the total up to about 2.9, and then our final budget after this final pay is approved tonight, or in uh, two weeks from now, rather, will be just over 2.7 mil due to some uh, in the field changes in quantities, uh, maybe putting a little bit uh, less asphalt in an area uh, that was necessary to do so. And all those changes uh, in the field were approved by me or our inspector. Um, I do have a PowerPoint to show some of the highlights of this project. So uh, just to note, this is in reference to the mill and overlay on this agenda item, but it's going to be a good opportunity for us to review the micro seal again and just all the improvements we did in the northwest zone. So here's a map showing the volume of streets. Um, the green is the micro seal, the red is the mill and overlay, and the blue is overlay only. So this project consisted of micro seal, mill, and overlay, and just a brief reminder, the micro seal is a protective coating on an above average street according to the pavement condition index. A mill is a removal of existing asphalt, usually two inches, and an overlay is laying new asphalt, usually two inches. So the micro seal project was very successful. This zone was heavy on the micro seal due to the existing pavement types and conditions. A large number of those streets were leveled up by the city street department to ensure a high quality base layer of asphalt for that micro seal. So here you will see uh, a large quantity of streets got the micro seal. And here are a couple of pictures. Uh, this is 12th and Martin Luther King on this picture. And uh, the mill and overlay, there were 33 streets that were milled off and repaved with asphalt as a part of this mill and overlay. And here is this list. And here's some pictures of mill and overlay. On the left, you can see uh, they have that street milled down and they're putting it back. And then um, you can see a couple other images of some really good work done by the contractor. So the overlay only. There were 19 streets that were overlaid as a part of this project. This provides just a top two inches of pavement. These streets were not milled to make our dollar go further, and that mill was not necessary when the street elevation does not impact drainage. And here's a list of those. And here's some pictures of just the overlaid streets. So here's a couple other pictures that I wanted to bring up. In that picture on the left, that's one of the micro sealed streets right next to or intersecting with uh, one of the overlaid streets. So you can see a little bit difference of uh, difference in the elevation of pavement 
uh, on the middle picture, part of this project, it, it gives us the opportunity to see those streets in a new light and see what we can do to improve the rest of the area. So that picture right there is from uh, Topeka Street in the Love Edition. And I don't know if you're familiar with what that area looked like before, but part of us uh, preparing for the <coughs> overlay is going through and raising the tree canopy so that that uh, dump truck and that lay down machine can get in there. So we cut the trees back and then after that street's paved, we wanna make sure that street stays in good condition. So we brought our grade all through and did a lot of ditch work in that area and has really improved the aesthetics of that area and then the, the street itself. And then on the far right side of the screen, we have Buffalo Drive up by the VA and we did our striping on that in-house. So it, that striping increases the safety and when we paved that street, we widened it out just a little bit to provide some more movement, uh, more mo room for turning movements right there. And that street has gotten us more thank you calls than any other street we've done being right there next to the VA. So we're very proud uh, of that one. And then here's the map again. Just so you can see a little bit after the pictures. And then in summary, many improvements were made to the Northwest Zone. Paving and sealing the streets is the primary focus of this. However, there are additional perks such as the tree canopy being addressed and the, and the prominence of the improved drainage ditches cleaned out and reshaped by the city street <coughs> department. New roads bring a better driving surface to the residents of Muskogee, but with public image being one of the council's main initiatives, I want to bring up how much better some of these neighborhoods look after they get a fresh new street. It really does a lot for the uh, morale of the citizens and the aesthetics of the neighborhood. And then just one last thing, a special thank you to the council, the City of Muskogee Foundation, the Street Advisory Committee, our employees for their work in the prep, and then the citizens of Muskogee for uh, working with us while we were working in their area. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I have a question. First of all, I want to say uh, thank you for all the hard work you guys have done. We really appreciate it. Just had a question because I get it all the time. Why do the street look like that when it's wet, shiny? Um, so the way that asphalt is made, it has oil in it. And over time, when that rain gets on the street, it brings just a minute amount of oil up to the top over years. It takes 20, 30 years for it to bring all the oil up. But that oil is what's shining when it gets wet. Thank you. Entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. A motion is second. Patrick Hale. Yes. Marlene Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. <coughs> Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. I'm number seven passes. I'm number eight, please. Consider approval of change order number one for the four corners signal improvements project number 2016040 with traffic and lighting systems LLC in the amount of $68,295.60 or take other necessary actions. Mr. Reeves. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, committee. Uh, this ch uh, change order had two elements. One element was striping on Broadway Street from Maine to Cherokee, which included parking spaces and traffic striping. The second element to the project was for uh, sidewalk concrete improvements around the four corner signalization improvement project. We found that uh, there was a lot of deteriorated sidewalks around the uh, project. And so as we were uh, doing them, we identified which of these elements needed to be removed and replaced. And uh, there were elements around Cherokee and Okmogee, Cherokee and Broadway, Cherokee and Callahan, Maine and Callahan, and the Callahan Bridge. Uh, we had, uh, also there was some uh, ADA compliant tactile uh, matting that needed to be replaced, and there was uh, some uh, concrete that needed to be replaced on Callahan Bridge. Uh, be happy to answer any questions, but staff does recommend approval. Thank you. Do you have any questions for staff? Can you retain a motion? I'll second it. A motion is second. No further discussion. Roll call, please. Patrick Hale. Yes. Marlene Boyati Craig. Yes. Charlie Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. I'm number seven. I'm number eight passes. I'm number nine, please. 
Consider approval of the lowest and best bid in the amount of $450,000 from Cook Consulting LLC for the Haskell Pump Station, project number 2022021, as recommended by Cowan Group Engineering, or take other necessary action. So I'm going to do a brief overview real quick and then hand it off to Jeff for the rest of it. So here's a little slideshow. So the Haskell Pump Station, what is it you might be asking? The Haskell Pump Station is located at the intersection of Shawnee, West Shawnee, and uh, North 48th Street West. The Haskell Pump Station provides pressure up to and beyond the Haskell Wholesale Water Meter, which is located on the northeast side of Pe the Pecan Creek Bridge. The Haskell Pump Station serves approximately 2,000 people and the pressure is reduced at the water meter from about 115 PSI to 90 PSI. There are three booster pumps located at the Haskell Station, two 400 gallon per minute pumps at 120 total dynamic head, and then one 800 gallon per minute at 135 feet of total dynamic head, and the total dynamic head pertains to the pressure that it puts out to the system. So here's a map of where these things are. So the Haskell pump station is um, up by the ten tennis courts at Otter Heights. And then as if you're going to Taft, you'll cross over a bridge. That's where Pecan Creek is, and that's the Haskell master meter. And then for reference, 40th and Altmulgee is circled on the map. And then here's a picture of the pumps inside the Haskell pump station. And then from there, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Jeff to wrap up the rest of the item. Uh, the project will include a new roof, the R panel roof, 26 gauge roof, a uh, new generator and transfer switch, a uh, new fence around the perimeter of the building and parking lot, a uh, drive, a concrete drive, a split system for the HVAC heat and the air, uh, electrical improvements, lighting, uh, and all associated pump wiring, motor wiring, actuators, the system, the uh, pump station will get painted and uh, doors and doors and overhead doors will also get painted. Be happy to answer any questions if you guys have them. Uh, one more thing I'd like to add. This is part of the ARPA funding and this project was budgeted and it came in below budget and uh, we wanted to make sure that that price was good for what we wanted so we have a recommendation by the engineer that says this is what we want and this is the right route to take. Any questions for staff? Move, move, move. Second. I have a motion and a second. No further discussion. Roll call, please. Patrick Kale. Yes. Sterling Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. <coughs> that passes item number 10, please. Consider approval of the lowest and best bid in the amount of $87,001 from Anytime Roofing Incorporated for the facility's building roof replacement, project number 2023028, as recommended by Cowan Group Engineering, or take other necessary action. Uh, the For those of you who do, don't recognize the, the uh, maintenance building, it's at the fairgrounds. It's a small building with a green roof and the red exterior brick. Uh, the roof has been leaking in 24 places the last count, so it's time to get the roof replaced on the building. Uh, it will be a R panel roofing like the uh, pump station with 24 gauge roofing. Uh, the framing members will be replaced as needed. Uh, subsurface uh, panels will also be replaced in the project. Uh, the foam insulation on the interior of the roof will be sprayed on after the uh, old foam insulation has been removed. Be happy to answer any questions if you guys have any. Any questions for staff? Move for approval. Second it. We have a motion and a second. No further discussion. Patrick Kale. Yes. Roland Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item number 10 passes. Item 11, please. Consider approval of the appointment of Cleta Mullins to serve on the Wellness Initiative Coalition, filling the unexpired term of Linda Milton, commencing upon appointment and ending on I'm sorry, on August 31st, 2024, or take other necessary action. Councilor Briotti Creek. Uh, yes, this is my appointment and I'm happy for Cleta. She brings a lot of experience, so I move for approval 
or point me to second. Well, Let's have a motion and a second. No further discussion. Roll call, please. Patrick Hale. Yes. Sterling Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. <coughs> Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item 11 passes. Item 12, please. Consider approval of the appointment of Perry Hewitt to the Parks and Recreation Board during the unexpired term of Julie Maycomb, commencing upon appointment and ending April 30, 2025, or take unnecessary action. This Perry is the son of our former mayor, Kathy Hewitt, and he is strong, showing a strong interest in wanting to be on this board. I think he'd be good. Yes. Do you have a motion? Yes. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Patrick Kale. Yes. Sterling Boyardi Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item 12 passes. Item 13, please. Consider approval of the appointment of Dr. Jack Weaver to the Wellness Initiative Coalition to serve a four year term, filling the expired term of Dr. James Baker beginning February 1, 2024, and ending on January 31, 2028, or take other necessary action. This is my item, and I'm uh, very happy to recommend Dr. Weaver to the Wellness Board. You guys see him around town. He's really enjoying those Northwest paved roads. So my motion is uh, for Dr. Weaver. Motion is second. Roll call, please. Patrick Kale. Yes. Herman Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item 13 passes. Item 14, please. Consider approval of the appointment of Melanie Carey to the Historic Preservation Commission to serve a three-year term beginning February 1, 2024, and ending on January 31, 2027, or take other necessary action. Mayor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to approve as presented. The motion, I have a second. Second. The motion is second. Roll call, please. Patrick Kale. Yes. Herman Boyati Craig. Yes. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Jamie Stout. Yes. Mayor Derek Yes. Mayor Coleman. Yes. Out of 14 passes. Prior to the journey, we have the council to meet. Yes. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to take this opportunity to welcome the community to come out and help us celebrate here in the city of Muskogee on Monday, January the 15th which would have been the 95th birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King. Muskogee has the great honor of holding the title of having the only Martin Luther King Center in the state of Oklahoma. So this year, in addition to celebrating Martin Luther King Day, we are also kicking off uh, the 50th anniversary of the Muskogee Martin Luther King Center. It was in the year of 1974 that our Martin Luther King Center started. And my God, what a journey uh, it has been in the last 50 years. Our theme this year is honoring our past, uh, appreciating our present, and anticipating our future. And so with that, <clears throat> on Monday, January the 15th, we will kick off the, the year-long celebration of the uh, Muskogee Martin Luther King Center by celebrating Martin Luther King Day. Uh, rain, sleet, snow, no matter how cold it is, on January the 15th, there will be a celebration in the city of Muskogee in some form. Uh, our uh, plans are as followed. Um, we will have a pancake breakfast from 7 o'clock a.m. to 11 o'clock a.m. This is a free pancake breakfast uh, for anyone in the city of Muskogee that want to come by and fellowship and have a free breakfast. Our sponsor this year is McDonald's. They will be providing the good, uh, <coughs> even uh, McDonald's coffee. I don't know what the deal is with the coffee, but they said they even bring in their own McDonald's coffee. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to miss that. At 10 o'clock a.m., uh, the Muskogee Ministerial Alliance will come over and have the annual Martin Luther King Day Worship Celebration service. At 11 o'clock, we will line up for the parade. The lineup will begin on 12th Street. Uh, the, the deal with our Martin Luther King Parade, there is a form that you fill out in advance. If by chance you don't fill it out, you can fill it out there the day of. So we invite anyone who has a parade entry and would like to be in the parade, you can still uh, be a part of our Martin Luther King Parade by just showing up, lining up, and you can sign up at the same time. The parade will begin at 12 o'clock noon. Uh, 
the parade once it ends, we'll, uh, we will gather at the Muskogee Martin Luther King Center. So the parade route is from 12th Street, coming down Martin Luther King Street and ending on 3rd Street at the Muskogee Martin Luther King Center. And there at the Muskogee Martin Luther King Center is the parade after party, car show, kid zone, booths, vendors, food trucks, and we're also gonna celebrate and honor our beloved Dr. Marlon Coleman. This will be one of his final acts as mayor, and so we're gonna celebrate him in a great uh, fashion on that day. He's gonna give us a speech and all that kind of good stuff there after the parade. So once again, this will all be held on Monday, January the 15th at the Muskogee Martin Luther King Center. Come out and help us celebrate uh, unity, togetherness, under the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King. Everything he stood for, his legacy, will be honored on that day. Councilor Reed. With that, Public Works is adjourned. Oh, yeah, Marlon.